Well, I see a lot of familiar faces, so that's always good. Um, and I want to do this pretty informal, so if you have a question as, I, as I'm going through this, please ask. And uh, I'll probably need to repeat the question so that we can get it on tape, because this is going to be shared with other families as we go forward. Um, well, thanks for inviting me. It's always, uh, always a welcome any opportunity that I can to talk about autism and, and to uh, help families out. And so I'm hoping that what I'll, what I'll have to share with you um, is going to be very helpful. What I wanted to talk about tonight, when Julie asked me about some of the things that, that, um, that might be of interest, is one of the things that I've really been working very hard on, and especially the last year or so, uh, and that is the, the internal or the unseen things about autism. You know, and, and, and the information I'm going to share with you, I want to tell you where the source is, and that is, is from my, I, I've been blessed and I consider myself very fortunate that I have a number of friends who are adults that are on the autism spectrum. And these adults who, um, like I said, are certainly my friends, but they're an amazing resource for me to talk to and for them to tell me pieces of information about what they were dealing with that they can reflect on as they were growing up, what they continue to deal with, and sort of their feelings about what they're dealing with. And so uh, it, it, uh, a good friend of mine who is a PhD student at Penn State, Scott Robertson and I, uh, who we talk all the time. As a matter of fact, I spoke to him in the parking lot just before I came in here. Um, he and I started beginning to develop this whole conversation about the notion about uh, as issues that are maybe a little bit more uh, obvious and prevalent at a younger age, as some of those behaviors begin to, to fade a little bit, that we, soon, we have a tendency to think that because the behavior fades, then so does some of the things that were motivating that behavior at a younger age. And so he and I began to talk about some of the things that, that he was dealing with as an individual uh, on the spectrum. And it was, I found it very fascinating to, to to uh, find out that as he got older and as he was better able to regulate some of his own behaviors because he recognized them more, um, he began to realize that the people around him, his support network, began to actually think that everything was okay, that everything had kind of gone away. And what he was doing was dealing with it more internally now and it created a lot of stress for him, which in turn created new behaviors that he had to deal with. And so Scott's pretty insightful about his, his own uh, condition and his own personality and his own set of frustrations and his own set of successes. And so one of the fascinating things that that provides for somebody like myself as a clinician is that it, it, it sort of is giving me permission to have very in-depth conversations about things that, now Scott is very open with things. Now he, he really doesn't mind talking about any aspect of his life. That's not true of some of my other friends. Um, even though we're, as we're developing this conversation, they're beginning to open up a little bit more and more with it as well too. Scott, I hope to be able to talk about this at, um, at Autreat. Is anybody here familiar with Autreat? Autreat is a uh, conference that's held in upstate New York. It is a conference that is developed, organized, put on, and conducted by people who have autism. And tippies, like myself, to be able to go, pretty much we have to be invited. We have to be invited by one of the, by one of the leadership or one of the coordinators. And so um, Scott and I are hoping to be able to present a lot of the information that he and I are, are continuing to develop uh, at Autry. I think that especially the, the uh, family members and the, and the individuals there will find it relevant to the, to the set of circumstances they have now. You know, one of the things that, that can become, that, that becomes very frustrating to a person that's on the, on the spectrum is the, the, the recognition of, of well, let's, let me back up. What becomes significant is the fact that they, that they first of all want to be recognized for who they are and not necessarily for what they are. And this is, a, this is a driving set of, of dialogue that's among the, the group of persons who uh, are on the spectrum. And I'm not only talking about persons that are verbal that can express this. It, it, it seems to be one of those things where people have other ways of communicating, communicate very clearly that they concern themselves about people identifying what they are as opposed to who they are. And so um, one of my other friends told me that as she was growing up, she said that she was always sort of 
sort of identified as she had a sibling, but she was always identified uh, after they were, they were, their names were given, this is my child who is autistic. Of course, we don't really, you know, um, we, we don't do that really, but we have a tendency to identify because it gives an explanation for certain behaviors sometimes. And so we feel like we have to give an excuse for the behaviors, and, and so that name sort of says that's why the behavior is there. And so she said that, that as she grew older, she actually began to resent the fact that that was an identifier. Um, she said that, that you have to really know Georgie to appreciate. She said, she said, that's like somebody telling me that I'm a, a flaming, bald-headed, redhead. She said, that just makes no sense. And so it made no sense to me that I had to be identified by that one. Um, you know, so, so one of the things that I think that as, as we begin to see some of the trends that are happening in autism, we, we really had a strong focus on the idea that we need to find things like cures and resolutions for behaviors and things like this. And the self-advocacy community is very concerned by the fact that, that people view them as somebody who needs to be cured and fixed as opposed to someone that needs to be understood and supported. And so as we work through this with self-advocates, we're beginning to have a different dialogue now with people that are on the spectrum because they see themselves as simply somebody that is unique and needs to be understood and needs to be supported. That's not unlike any of us, that we see ourselves as a unique person with our own personality, with our own likes and dislikes, and we see that we need to be uh, treated with respect and supported. And so I don't have to tell you as family members that that's the way that you see your child. But one of the things that we, that we are ongoing constantly is working with other people in the community to see them the same way that we do and to support them the same way that we do and not see them as a, as a description but yet as the child for, or the adult for who they actually are. When, uh, uh, last year when, when uh, Scott, Scott came down last summer um, and spent an extended period of time with me and my family, and one of the things that uh, was, was very interesting about, about Scott's, uh, by the way, he had only ventured into the South one time before. Now, he's a, he is a homegrown northerner. He very rarely has ventured south of, uh, you know, south of the Virginia line, so to speak. And so uh, when he came to the, the deep South, it was somewhat of a culture shock, not to mention the fact that we in the South use all types of uh, idioms and figures of speech and references and he was very confused by some of the ways that we just interact with each other and, and you and I don't see it as being incredibly different even if we travel outside the South. He began to be very, very, uh, actually very interested in the way that we as Southerners interact with each other. And what makes that fascinating to me is, is that he turned it around and he says, you know, you Southerners need to be understood and supported because we don't really understand what you're saying sometimes. And, uh, and for example, he asked me, he said, in the South, you're always preparing to do things. And I said, well, everybody prepares to do things. And he says, yeah, but you find it, you find it a responsibility to tell people that you're about to do something. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you're always saying, we're fixing to go to the store. We're fixing to do this. And he said, I finally figured out that fixing has nothing to do with fixing anything. It's preparing. It's your substitute word for preparing. And I don't understand why you find the need to tell somebody that you are about to do something. It makes no sense to me. Um, and as I begin to think about it, I really have no explanation for that either. But, but it, are, it is little things like that that someone that has the observation skills of, of my friend Scott that we take for granted that becomes part of the complicated issue about how they need to be supported and how they need to be sort of, um, sort of coached along but at the same time not necessarily fixed. And, and you know, uh, uh, Scott certainly sees his, uh, himself as now a, a student of Southern language. I sent him a, a dictionary of Southern speaking language. And, he said he's got it committed to memory. He's going to be coming back uh, next month to spend about two weeks with me and my family. So I think one of the things that we, that we sometimes don't think about in autism is that if we begin to look around other things, like in this case, a cultural difference, that's not dissimilar in many ways than the culture of, a, of an individual who has autism. And there is definitely a culture within that, within that group of individuals. A culture that is 
uh, if you've ever spent much time around a lot of adults with autism, um, you'll begin to find out that they're that they're very culturally aware of the fact that they are alike but different, but alike and different from other people that are around them. And so that's that's something that that this this self advocacy uh, group has begun to celebrate is their differences and their and their even as Scott says, even my eccentricities, um, those are parts of what makes me who I am. And like I said, he's a PhD student. He just defended his proposal. Uh, it wasn't easy. We finally got to that point and got through that. Uh, but he defended that proposal. Now we're going to begin to collect data uh, and, and work toward finishing that PhD up. And he's going to then uh, hopefully find a job in research. He wants to be a research design person. And uh, I think he'll do exactly that. One of the other things, too, though, I think, is that there are, there are certainly certain um, public pressures in the autism community to, to, I guess, follow certain trends is the right way to say. You know, we think about treatment always having to have a, an outcome of a cure, so to speak, or we think of treatment as having to have an outcome of some other type of resolution uh, um, status, so to speak. And, and that's certainly what we should, we should shoot for, but I think one of the things that, that some of the treatments that are out there now begin to do is they begin to be a little bit too harsh in trying to program the individual to become something that the treatment program says the outcome should be as opposed to what the individual should be. And so there's a lot of discussion about that across this country right now, about how certain kids that go through certain types of programs are very, very similar in behavior and language delivery and all these kinds of things, and that's becoming concerning now to a certain group of, uh, to a large group of professionals out there. So. Uh, it, it's going to be very interesting to see as we move forward because autism is, as, as a profession is still in its intimacy, uh, in infancy, if you think about it, because um, even though we certainly have had individuals who have been on the spectrum for a long time, we really only consider it a field of study for a very short period of time. Now, how long that is, I'm not real sure. Like I said, I've, I've got two decades plus, and you know, 20 something years ago when I would say that, that my field of interest is autism, I would have colleagues that say, why? There's like three of those people. I mean, well, why would you spend your whole life studying three or four people? Well, that was never the case, but people were that sort of off base about what autism was and was becoming and how it was ultimately defining itself. One of the other issues that has to do with the uh, kind of an autism update, and this is still part of this conversation that I've already mentioned about, about the uh, self-advocacy movement and the internalization of these new things, is that um, we are beginning to, to uh, actually close in on the conversation, and you probably uh, have seen some of this conversation with the APA, is that it looks like diagnostically we're going to be moving away from terms such as PDD, NOS, and Asperger syndrome, and as opposed to it becoming more of an autism spectrum disorder uh, as, a, as a diagnosis, and beginning to identify the specific areas of focus that needs to happen for an individual. In other words, the intensity of some of the uh, areas that, that programs need to focus on as opposed to saying, okay, here's a person who has Asperger's syndrome and we're going to put them in this program, or this person has more classic autism and this is a more appropriate program. That seems to be more based on a diagnostic category as opposed to a true picture of what uh, areas that they are most challenged in. That conversation in the APA right now has been drug out for a long time. Um, the, the newest um, uh, draft that was put out actually does fold some of the other things into autism and move some uh, terminology completely out. Asperger's, for instance, is one of them. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see where that lands. Have you, have you seen some of that conversation? Yeah, I haven't read the actual text, but I've yeah. seen the debate about it. It's, a, it, it's, it's been a pretty uh, intense discussion because um, if you get into the folks that are in, the, in diagnostics, uh, 